Hey Vanguard, it's me, Preston, aka Victor from Tales of Anaria. I'm coming at you with a special Ask Me Anything episode. Uh, we're between season one and season two. So if you haven't seen season one yet, go ahead and check it out. Um, if you're here to find out a little bit more about Victor, where he came from, there might be some spoilers, so um, just be forewarned. Uh, but this format is basically going to be some questions that were posed by people in the Discord. Uh, many of our community members of, of the Vanguard, like yourself. Uh, hopefully, if not, like, subscribe. And uh, yeah, we'll just get started with the questions. Great question. So um, before getting too deep into how they kind of view honor or define honor, uh, I think it would be best to also understand what the core tenets of the creed are. So they are as follows. The first, never neglect or be without your blade. It is a direct reflection of your soul. A dull blade is a dull mind, which can only lead to sorrow. Number two, protect those in your ring with honor, teach those without, and ravage those unpenitent. Number three, a drawn blade is to support your beliefs, defend those you love, or to smite your challenger. Number four, hey guys, it's Preston. I kind of screwed this one up. I know. Uh, number five, seek knowledge before bloodshed. The truth will guide your blade. Number six. Should you falter, your ring will suffer. Seven. Receive gifts, but only with one hand, that the other may remain unsullied for your blade. And number eight. The dance of death is solemn and holy, and each execution should be a masterful artwork to be remembered. Without getting too deep into the weeds with all the different wings, the different names for the wings, how do they define honor? I would say that they all kind of define it the same, where your word is your bond. Um, and if you if you are going to go forward with something, biggest thing is that it needs to not hurt your family. It needs to make sure that it protects you as well as like kind of the, the, the face of the creed or the of the eight rings, um, because you don't want to be able basically you don't want to bring violence upon them. They are considered your family, right? Um, that family is very important to them. That's another large thing that in that uh, Eight Rings culture. So, you know, I think the idea, the initial idea was like, hey, let's be, let's come together. Let's show the other countries. Let's show the other cities that we're not a threat, that we are a strong force, but we're not here to take over and that, that we're, we're honorable. Like when we say that we're going to do something um, kind of as a, as a survival tactic, if you will, because it's a very much a stratocracy, a stratocracy where the strongest are the ones that are leading. Um, and since they are displaced from their original homeland, spoiler alerts again, um, from Hasmonday, um, where that we saw that Azanari was brought into the Astral Sea and we had this large shield that's been created to protect the people. Uh, when that was destroyed, as Bolt's ship came through and all that old steel kind of wreaked havoc and destroyed Hasmonday, the survivors were basically scrounging and scraping to, to survive. Uh, they were they didn't have a home anymore. And those who, who did have a home in Hasmonday, they didn't remember it even existed. So this kind of coming together and putting that face to the family, if you will, um, feeling like they have each other's backs, rather than going into another place where they may not be welcome, they may not be looked upon as native to the land that they, they are coming to occupy. Great question, Zagan, uh, or Zagan, Zagin. <laughs> While nothing today is really, truly original, uh, everybody is deriving some kind of inspiration from other sources, whether that be from books, um, childhood experiences, uh, whether that be from movies, television, uh, radio, any of those kinds of things can help influence uh, kind of our creative process, right? There was a lot of different things that kind of went into the inspiration for not only the Eight Rings, but Victor themselves. And I guess the best way to try and map that out was in the beginning, I started with the concept of Victor. Out the gate, Victor was actually supposed to be very calculated and very vicious, very, very like lawful evil was kind of what I was what I was initially thinking for his particular brand. Initially, I was beating around the bush. I was trying to figure out what class should I play? <laughs> it's not Bard because I do Bard and I love Bard, but I wanted to try and push myself and kind of experience some other ways that uh, the gameplay can be had. 
and Corey approached me with one of these ideas that he had with the knife dancer. And we went back and forth and talked about some different things, maybe putting in some some uh, different abilities that I thought thematically would be a lot of fun to play. Uh, specifically having in mind uh, Naruto character. I'm not going to give any spoilers there either. But essentially he had this dagger that he could throw and he could, he could basically switch places with it. It was kind of like a teleportation. And once we kind of settled on that, I was like, okay, that's cool. I want to run with that. And um, while that idea was forming in my head, I also was thinking about a video game that I... I played for years uh, called League of Legends and in there there's this character he's kind of scary and creepy sociopathic but awesome uh, character named Jin and he is this he's obsessed with the performance he's obsessed with with um, kind of going out and the world is his stage and there's this this grand kind of like operatic um, pomp and circumstance to the way that he goes about his fighting and I thought, oh, that'd be really cool to be able to pull that kind of bardic portion of things into the, the rogue side. Uh, and so uh, he was, he was, Victor was going to be very calculated, very kind of really um, in that darker side of the spectrum as far as characters go. And as that, that kind of evolved, I started thinking, OK, well, what do I want to do with the, the character as well? You know, I have some staples like I want to make sure that, um, you know, he has a good backstory. He's got... Um, I don't want to do the trope where the rogue has the tragic pack backstory. All his parents have died, his siblings, everyone's massacred, and then he became a rogue. Uh, so I thought, okay, well, what if his mom and dad were in on it, right? And what if they were a part of the organization that raised him to think, oh, this is okay. This is okay to take what's mine because I it's that survival of the fittest, right? I wanted his, it to be really steeped in tradition. I really wanted to have that kind of Bushido or like very code... Um, very, very, not dogmatic, but very, very stringent kind of um, set of rules that he would need to follow. Because number one, how do you play a rogue when he has a code of honor? How do you steal something if it's not honorable, right? And so then it got my mind thinking a little bit more, okay, what kind of, of person would he be? What kind of people would he hang out with? What would he be looking for as he went throughout uh, an area on his on his progress? Uh, and it wasn't until later that I had the idea that I was going to blind the rogue and have him throwing knives. But but I I did take that as kind of like the, the core tenet of being like, okay, I need to figure out a creed. I was around the time Mandalorian was on uh, Disney Plus. So not affiliated, not sponsored, yada, yada, yada. But um, I really liked the idea of the Mandalorian creed, right? It's something that for anyone who played any of the old uh, Knights of the Old Republic games, uh, or read any of the books or had any kind of like been steeped in that knowledge of kind of the Star Wars lore. That was one of the things that Mandalorians always kind of fascinated me. I always thought that was really cool. I always liked the the kind of the mysteriousness that kind of surrounded their culture as well as that very militaristic uh, kind of upbringing. And so when I was starting to think about Victor and how he might um, kind of interact with the world, I thought, okay, that's a good opportunity to say, okay, there's here's, here's something that um, he has an honor code but maybe to the average person, some of those things might not be as honorable. Um, but to him, it is like, that's the law. That is that is what he lives by. Taking all these ideas and putting them together, um, I, th I initially thought that maybe he would be raised by this bloodthirsty band of rogues that for him, he grew up thinking, oh, this is just like innocent, you know? Oh yes, this is just what you do. You steal from people, you, you take their money, you do all these different things. But as it kind of crept and evolved, I started to think about, okay, well, well, wouldn't it be interesting to apply a set of rules that are kind of, you know, honorable, but kind of lace in there these, these undertones or these ambiguities that if someone in power came and said, hey, this is how we lived, this is the creed we live by, and twisted it just a little bit so that they could kind of either manipulate it to what they believed was right or twist it to, to maybe better suit their narrative. If anyone's familiar with the anime Bleach, uh, that was one of the places where when I was forming the rings of the creed, I thought it would be really cool to have that same kind of interplay between the rings where each captain, uh, or in this case primes, uh, had their own way of ruling their people, so to speak, or directing their squadron. And um, on the top of them, they have this large, this, this kind of apex of sorts, at least in the first season. And the um, I really like that idea where you could actually take 
um, a lot of different people with different backgrounds and different like ideologies and kind of mash them together into these these haphazard squadrons that is a little bit more militaristic in nature um, but it becomes more like like a family someone who you learn to depend on and is like that forged in fire kind of feeling Oh man, is Victor nervous for returning to the rings? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. One of the biggest things you notice about Victor when you're watching is that he is very steeped in this, this strong sense of loyalty to the Eight Rings. The level of, of dogma within the Eight Rings that he's raised on, that was his bread and butter. He didn't know anything else until leaving. Up until that point, that was like, that was his whole worldview was from the Eight Rings going against the the edict of the prime and as well as his mother that was really big for him to he had to weigh his options do i take my my childhood hero and take their word or do i believe the people who have taught me everything i know uh since i was born like which which one of these like i have to weigh these options and the, the only reason that he had he had allowed it was because he believed her um akin to like demigod status um, they're like the superheroes. It'd be, it'd be like Superman walking up and be like, hey, man, it's okay. You can jaywalk. So next part of that question, uh, does he think that because he saved one of the primes that it's okay? Yes and no. Uh, just because he saved the prime? No. But because he saved the prime and the prime, uh, which he views as basically as the person who wrote all the commandments for his people, I think he still thinks he's going to have to defend his actions. While he definitely sees Pratia's, um her, he sees her her voice having weight. He also recognizes that Taka and the, the the apex of the Eight Rings right now is very dogmatic, and he he, he sticks to his guns. He did, he's very steadfast and unchanging, and uh, he sees that as like a rock in a hard place. He's kind of putting himself between two people that that he sees as very powerful and that he's very loyal to, and and yeah, he he absolutely is nervous about going back and finding out <laughs> what kind of punishment he's going to get built on build onto his head now uh, at this point you've probably already seen the episode and if not i apologize for any spoilers um but it was a very transformational moment for him to be able to to look at taka and recognize that some of the things that he had been taught and some of the things that he had built all his paradigms about um, had warped and had been changed and that they were un they weren't right and he had to challenge those paradigms and I don't it's very uncomfortable to do that uh, and so him being able to have that kind of growth uh, for me was really it was really fun to see all right so this next one I think is at me <laughs> so why why is he always a bard? I just love bards. I love the I love the the parading. I love the the flamboyancy. I love I love going out and having that high charisma character that uh, you know and I definitely have fun with with kind of the lower intelligence or lower wisdom characters as seen with who <laughs> among us the kind of more more joke character but I have a lot of fun in those in those scenarios. But I I'd really like the high charisma characters and with the bard um, I think I see a lot of myself in that kind of jack of all trades type uh, field where it's that jack of all trades, master of none, but still always better than a master of one. Um, I've always really loved learning things and trying new things, and that might be the ADD talking, whatever. <laughs> but th there was a lot of chaos there. Um, and I liked the mechanics that were in it. Uh, I liked the, and for me, if you if you know me in real life, you hear constantly phrases pop culture music just kind of it just kind of dribbles out of my mouth <laughs> and um sometimes you know and for me i felt like that that was kind of a natural segue into the kind of bardic class yeah bards bards for life i really love bards <laughs> if someone touches my dice do i cut their fingers off or just break them yes yes and yes as evidenced that you've never seen anybody touch my dice. So like, how do you know it hasn't happened?
What are some of the courtship rituals in the rings? That's an interesting question. Mm, somebody has been watching some of those more recent episodes. Um, and between rings and wings, does it thievery play a part perhaps? Yes, the thief of the heart. Um, one of the things that often in knife dancing, one of the things that, at least in the rings themselves, is kind of showing an interest. And there's this very strong uh, analogy that I kind of built into that with the uh, taking something that's a nymph or a young version of a butterfly that goes into a chrysalis and has this transformative process through the chrysaline uh, into this more butterfly state where they're able to fly and kind of show um, the world their magnificent colors and, and all the different shapes and sizes. And in that, um, I thought that it was very special to have that kind of ritual of of giving and receiving right and so yeah in in as far as the culture in the eight, eight rings one of the things is a gift giving a gift to someone and receiving a gift back from them as kind of a, a recognition of your gift so like when a nymph in the eight rings is given a blade they are essentially inviting them and saying hey i think that you're good enough come become part of the core creed or come, come see if you can survive the chrysling and become a part of the, the eight rings. Um, the kind of a recruitment process, however you want to call that. But it's the same thing when it comes to kind of the marriage and, and those types of rituals. And so in this same kind of context, so here's a little bit of spoiler alert. In theory, okay, in theory, allegedly, when a knife dancer gives a gift to another knife dancer, specifically giving them, uh, especially if they're they're already a, have gone through the chrysling and they're a full-fledged member um, of their, of the, the eight rings, giving them a blade is kind of like saying, hey, I'm interested uh, in courtship, right? And starting that process. And receiving one in kind is basically saying, giving consent and saying, yes, I am also interested. Stealing, it probably incentivizes Victor a little bit more to go and seek out uh, the things that are precious to him, like his broom. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it definitely there, there's more courtship there. Uh, one of the other things I guess I can mention is that once that goes and becomes more serious, if that ever end resulted in a marriage, usually what happens is the stronger of the two uh, within that relationship, the the other person would take their um, the, the primary wing of the other and become their secondary wing. So they would start to practice the things that the, the, the stronger does. And that would become kind of their, um, it, it's called a shadow wing where they essentially are practicing that same. So like if I was a Ruby wing and I was very passionate about stuff and I, maybe I, they, they go and marry someone from the Onyx wing, then they would have to reform some of their ideas. Of, of that kind of passion and rebirth and move that into kind of that legal, having a passion for legality or a passion for assassinations or things like that. So that way there's that kind of um, give and take between them. So this might be a spoiler, um, th or this is a fan theory, some headcanon here, I think. That would be pretty cool. Um, I think that the Victor would be the, he's of that mindset of, he doesn't necessarily want to have to choose his family. He loves to uh, bring people together from different places and different ideas. And while he has his own kind of like really strong feelings about certain things like legal papers, making sure you have contracts for things. Uh, not touching his knives, <laughs> as was evidenced in recent ep episodes. I think they would be, he would be interested and kind of excited to understand the the legality behind it as far as like the the history. When did it become formed and like why was it formed and who's informed about this and like what is what is it and what's its involvement? Um, I think he would be very interested in trying to understand that, especially from like having something with citations and like, yes, it came from this document from this place uh, this time. So uh, I think it'd be cool. That's a cool, I think it's a cool fan theory. So here's another question that was regarding the knife dancers class right now, the one that's available. 
Um, I know Corey is working on doing an update to that subclass um, because right now I think it's intelligence is what it kind of is kind of hard coded towards, but it's supposed to be open to, I believe, uh, intelligence or wisdom and maybe charisma. So double check. Um, I guess we can update this in the description uh, once that's finished. But yeah, yeah, definitely look forward to that. There are some updates coming for the subclass. As far as what Victor's using right now, he's using wisdom. So he's using his wisdom. I figured like street smarts, that type of vein felt uh, good for, for Victor because he tends to be a klutz sometimes when he's uh, with, at least with his words, or he can be a little less diplomatic, doesn't have quite as much tact as others. So yeah, so he's using wisdom right now. Does Anaria have a rock, paper, scissors version that goes wings, bings, rings? No, but it does now. Uh, I, I'll i have to... Uh, Corey, cannon. <laughs> so, wings, rings, things. Nope, I got it wrong already. Wings, things... I don't know what rings would be. Rings? Uh, you tell me. I, in the comments, it, describe to me if you have any ideas how that might work. I'd love to hear it. So which wing or wings does Victor want to join? That's a great question. Um, if pressed right now, or if, if, if you pressed him early on, I think he would probably uh, gravitate towards the Onyx wing or the Ruby wing, uh, just because naturally those are where his tendencies lie. He has a very strong sense of, of kind of those relationships and loyalty to the people around him, um, as well as that legality and uh, less less about like the going and actually like cutting people's throats and killing them, uh, but more of that legality portion. So I'd, I'd say it's between the two of them, um, which makes sense why he is so enamored with uh, Lyra and why kind of that, that relationship is something that he uh, values. As far as like which one he would have to choose between, uh, I think he probably would take Ruby as his primary wing, but he also kind of fits in the diamond wing as far as that steadfastness, because he's very, He's very wants things to be the same. He's very he doesn't want like a lot of change. Um, and he, while he can be passionate and adventurous, I think that going through the crystalline and having that kind of cold bucket of water dumped on his head really kind of gave him a wake up call. So he had to reassess and reevaluate the way that he was living his life. So um, I think that, yeah, I think Ruby would probably be his his primary wing um, and how much of that is just familiarity with his family and with his mother and father being a part of it um, but who knows maybe maybe he'll, he would uh, take on a second wing shadow wing that's another great question um, I think that it's not necessarily a knife dancer per se that would uh, cut off someone's finger in that regard it's more so someone in the eight rings and it's it really has to do with that upbringing and that really strict sense of kind of reverence and honor for those blades that um, that I, there's plenty of knife dancers within an area that are outside of the eight rings. Uh, just typically that that is something that's seen as something that they really, really sunk their teeth into uh, and ran with as far as their like work. Read, so. You know what? We made it all the way to the end hopefully this answers some of your burning questions uh, about tales of an area about victor um if there's interest in the future um perhaps we'll release some special content relating to backstories maybe some dramatic readings i don't know something fun tell us in the comments below what you want to see uh, appreciate you guys hanging out appreciate you coming and uh, learning a little bit more about tales of an area and uh, if you're interested in becoming a part of the vanguard make sure and smash the subscribe and like button below Thank you guys so much for spending time with us uh, each week. I love going through and reading your comments. Uh, we're so excited for season two coming out, and we hope that you guys are too. And I hope to see you guys then. So until then, next time, Vanguard. <laughs>